Hello, and welcome to Books of the Month. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Carnes, and we're excited to have a very special guest with us today. She's going to be sharing this book with us, Pages and Leaflets of North Oxfordshire. Now, I've looked at this. This is such a powerful book, Miss Angela Portnum. Angela, how are you today? I'm doing fine, thank you. How about you? I'm doing well, doing well. We're excited to have you as our guest. Introduce yourself to our viewing audience and then start to share this powerful book with us. As I was looking at this book, it talks about the generations of your grandfathers and you're opening that up. I saw how you went from being in agriculture to labor life to then self-employment. You just take us on a journey when we look at this book. So share that with our audience. Introduce yourself. My name is Angela Fortnum, and I come from Banbury, North Oxfordshire in England. I decided to write a book about my history, family history, because I wasn't sure exactly where my roots stood. I've gone back oh. eight generations back to my seventh times great grandfather, James. That's amazing, moved... all of these generations. So go ahead and give our audience insights into the book and share your story with us. Well, as I just recently said, I didn't quite know where my roots were. So this was a good opportunity to find out my, my genes, where I came from. The, the, the history of my family. Where do I start? Good question. So I hadn't got many living re relatives, only my mother. So I quizzed her about what she knew, which unfortunately was very little. My next stage was to go to the public library, where fortunately for me, they keep records of parish registers. I knew that several generations came from a small village north of Banbury called South Newington. So I went to that parish register and started back from my grandfather, tried to find his father, tried to then find his father, and so on back through the generations. Parish registers kept different information depending on who wrote wrote who the parish clerk was. Parish registers also gave, gave birth, marriages and deaths in the village. So if I couldn't find a birth, a marriage or death, then I had to look in village information surrounding South Newington, because you must bear in mind, many, many years ago, people didn't travel very far. Lagoon certainly travelled very far until they perhaps got, they worked from home, helped their mother. Some of them went into service, but that wasn't until more recent times. It's, you know, no, as no. I'm looking here at the book and as I was doing research, you talked about the agriculture part and yeah. then being laborers and then going into self-employment and then some small holdings talk to us about the progression yeah. of that as you look at your different families and going back to the generation what was the progression and how did that happen well james page my seventh seventh generate the seventh times great grandfather the eighth generation was an agricultural laborer now you must remember in those days we're talking about the 17 16 17 18 hundreds People hadn't got any money, they couldn't afford the land, so they rented it or worked for the Lord of the Manor. They saw they worked with the poor, they couldn't, they didn't understand about, like we do, about fertilizers, although fertilizers aren't very good for the environment and things like that. And they didn't actually. Um, 
pay attention to birth control, if I can put it that way. So they had huge families and the, the land couldn't sustain the family of boys. They had to go out and find their own um, land to work on, which meant that they, of course, probably moved away from the family village. John followed in James's footsteps and he had a son called John. They weren't very imaginative in those days with regard to names. They would probably name a boy after his father, maybe his grandfather, a daughter after the mother, the grandmother. So it was a very, very difficult thing to research in some cases because you'd have a cousin called John, whose father was John, but John, John too, if you like. His father was William, but which John was which when they got older in life. So it was a lot of detective work. My five times grandfather, John, had 12 children. He, was, he became quite wealthy. We don't know quite how. Um, he was the first one that I could trace that actually had a will given such things as um, a flock mattress to one of his daughters. He, he didn't give very much away. <laughs> John had a son called James. He was a weaver. 1775, that was still a thriving business. James then had a son called John, who had 10 children, five with his first wife, three of whom survived, and five from his second wife. Wow. The, 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 one of the sons then started again my line. The thing was, when John's first wife died, he'd got five children. He got a job to do to keep them fed and watered. So he found his second wife, Hannah. She wanted a roof over her head. John wanted a wife to look after his children. Seemed a sensible thing to do for them to get married. And that's what happened in those days. In 1819, John became a parish clerk. If you remember, that's the person that writes up all the registers, the marriage, birth, death registers for the church. This meant that he was quite well read in as much that he could read and write. Not many people in those days could. Because the people that were being recorded in the marriage register, birth register or whatever, couldn't actually spell their name and they would have um, a country accent. It was up to John to try and decipher what they were saying and transcribe it into the marriage register, death register, whatever. He remained parish clerk and, uh, until he died in 1851. By that time, he was a weaver. He, he probably lived in a cottage downstairs and had the weaving business upstairs. If you like, he was an artisan of his time. It's quite, I mean, this is a fascinating and very quite interesting story, I tell you, and it's so much history that you're sharing with us there. So, wow, very, 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 very interesting. History, 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 and sharing the history of your family continue to what would be some 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 key things that you would like to just really place emphasis on because this is a fascinating story the progression and how things took place well one thing i would like to say john's got his place in history like many parish clerks of the day when people got married they needed two witnesses to the marriage very often they only had one so John, or the parish clerk at the time, would become the second witness and his name would appear in the register. So that's down for all time. 
Wow, that is amazing. That is powerful, powerful, powerful. I tell you, there's so much in here. It's interesting. Uh, what about the, now, now you talk about, I, I was interested when you said, when I looked at the agriculture, the labor life, and then the self-employment, why, what, why does that transition take place where there was that progressiveness going from one lifestyle to another lifestyle? What about the self-employment there, business ownership? It was, it was very, very slow, the progression. Um, in fact, the really, it wasn't until the 1800s that people began to think about working for themselves or working in a slightly different in industry. My um, great-grandfather, Charles, um, was a miller. He didn't own the mill, he rented the mill, mm. but he actually was a, a miller. His son, who was the son of um, Joseph, who was a baker. So it sort of followed on. Agricultural labourers um, produced produce. And it was a bit in the wrong order, really. Joseph was a baker, but Joseph's son was a miller. So he needed the wheat to make the bread. But as I say, it was the wrong way round, really. Joseph yes. was a baker. Now, Joseph, the son of John, the parish clerk, couldn't write. This was evidenced by the marriage certificate when instead of signing his name, he put an X. So that was another puzzle for him. Why couldn't James write? What, sorry, why couldn't Joseph write? His father could, so why couldn't he? Why didn't he teach him? Good question, I told myself. My theory, and it's only a theory because I've got no way of proving one way or the other, that Joseph, like me, was left in now, if you think back to the olden days, 1840-ish time, when Joseph got married, if you use a pen in your left hand in England, you were actually rubbing your hand across what you've written, smudge it. So an X, okay. would, an X would probably survive, but he, if he signed his name properly, it would all smudge. And I'm guessing that this disheartened him, so he didn't learn to write properly. He didn't take it forward. Yeah, so as I listen to your story and how you're navigating and all the research that it took to, to, to trace your family tree from generations to generations and your grandfathers and then both sides of the family, what was it that drove you, that motivated you to do this research? And how much time did it take for you to commit to this effort? Well, I wanted to do the research, as I said, because I wanted to understand my family roots. Why I felt comfortable in the market town rather than the big city. Why did I feel uncomfortable when I went to work in Birmingham, in the huge metropolis? And I think I can answer when I did this research that all my grandparents came from the countryside. They had a quiet rural life. And that is what I think suits me. The second wow, question that is was, some that is some effort that you put into in, in, into this research. And I'm telling you, it took some dedication on your part to really uh, explore and do this. Now, when you talk about the self-employment, you talk about the things of that nature. We're gonna pick up there when we come back from taking a break. So we want you all to stand by, we're gonna take a break and we'll be right back with you. Thank you for tuning into this TV broadcast. We hope that it is a blessing to you. Did you know that when you donate to this TV broadcast, we can make mention of your ministry or your business here? Did you know that by donating, you can also receive special vacation travel gift incentives? Enjoy a complimentary three-day and two-night hotel stay. Take a long-needed vacation with the seven-day hotel stay in Hawaii or your favorite resort city. 
consider a three-day, two-night Bahamas cruise or airfare for two and two-night hotel stay. Your donation to support this broadcast comes with rewards. For more information, visit www.sponsorthisshow.org. That's www.sponsorthisshow.org. Well, welcome back. You know, we're so excited to have our very special guest with us. Ms. Angela, you've been sharing with us and giving us insights into the history of your family and this awesome research that you've done. Let's talk about this. I noticed in the book, you talk about changes in religious beliefs. Talk about that for us and share with us what you discovered when you talk about the changes in religious beliefs. Right, going back to 1700, my seven times great grandfather, the really eighth generation back, I noticed in the parish records that he had a son who died extremely young as a baby, and he was buried in what was known as Ye, ye Old Meeting Yard, i.e. he wasn't buried in the parish churchyard. Ye Old Meeting Yard meant he was married at Quaker House in the garden. So I haven't gone back into John's parents yet. That was a bit of a brick wall. But so um, James was a Quaker, and but his children were baptized eventually into the Church of England. I say eventually because many of them were baptized as adults. And of course, John, the, my five times great grandfather, who was also a parish clerk, would have been parish clerk for the Church of England register. So we, we travel forward now in time to Joseph, who I mentioned before, the baker. He joined up with several colleagues and set up a primitive Methodist chapel. Unfortunately, mm. this is closed and has become a private house. Whereas his brother Joseph, sorry, his, his younger brother Thomas, Joseph's younger brother Thomas, um, lived in the neighbouring village of Wigginton, and he set up the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel that stands today and is used as a chapel. There are, there's a, a stone by the front door with Thomas's wife's name on it. What they did was they paid a contribution to build the chapel they bought stones and had their names put on them. So they were primitive Methodists. However, Joseph must have in turn become Church of England again <laughs> because he raised all his children as Church of England believers and that's what we are today. Okay. So, so Church of England believers. Yes. What, what Church of England? Okay, so this is this is you know quite fascinating and interesting. And you say even till today the family is a part of the Church of England believers, correct? Yeah, we're part of the Church of England. We follow their um, creed, if you like. Okay. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about that. Well, what's what's some insights into the Church of England? and the re religious beliefs and how there's been that progression, if you will, based upon family members and the way that you all were brought up in different religious beliefs and things of that nature. Well, as people will see when, when they buy my book, there are pictures of the Wigginton Methodist Chapel. I couldn't put in a copy of the South Newington Chapel, which is now closed, because this is a private house and I didn't want people's privacy to be um, uh, intruded by people. I've also got pictures of South Newington Parish Church, Bloxham Parish Church, and other parish churches relative to the wives or husbands of the family that were married into the Page family, um, with pictures of um, frescoes on the wall, 
um, and some one or two interesting insights as to when the building was built, what it was built of, teasers really, to encourage mm -hmm. people to open the book properly and to see, go and visit the churches. Because obviously the churches in this country are very much older and different from many churches in other parts of the world. Yes. Now, now, now that's an interesting point. You talk about the churches being different from other churches in different parts of the world. And I know they're older age that have been there for centuries and centuries. So when you say they're different, what's, what are some of the things that are distinctive about the churches in England? Well, they're very dark for one thing. There's leaded windows, very narrow, built, built in the time of no electric light. Obviously, they've got some electricity now. Yes. But but they 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 could be considered gloomy when they were built. Very dark and really unimposing. But now, um, with some electricity and some cleaning up and some history attached to them, I think they're quite interesting. That is right, fascinating. So now, the religious beliefs. I'm thinking back again to the to the businesses and the things of that nature. How did the two did they merge at any time? Did they the the venturing off and into becoming business oriented? I know you talked about the baker and you talk about the religious beliefs and how the baker started to practice this type. How impacting were the religious beliefs on the businesses as you did your research and move up until today? Well, they, they seem oceans apart, really, but people prayed for good crops. People prayed for rain. People prayed for sunshine. People really prayed for a good harvest. Yes. They, they, they were believers. Yes, yes. That's a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating journey. I noticed something here about the small holdings. You know, when we talked about the agriculture, then we went from the labor and then we got to small holdings. What about the small holdings? What, what, what's interesting about that? That's, that's my grandfather. He um, was originally um, a miller again a uh, tenant um, but the mill owner wanted to sell it so obviously grandfather had to move out and he became a small holder small amount of land in the village where he kept cattle or sheep or maybe grew some crops we don't know we've got no record to tell us one way or the other he had six children five of which um, lived one died at a very young age for an illness and he managed to keep them into well reasonable good uh, health he looked he 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 did his best for them and they all yeah. turned out very well including my mother <laughs> yes so that's your mother's side of the family this is all this is all my mother's side of the family yes 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 wow very my very next, very my next book book one if i ever get that far if i ever live long enough will be my father's side of the family okay wow so have you began to to, to already do the research i i've done a bit of research um, I found out that Peggy Fortnum, who is the illustrator of the Paddington Bear books, um, is, a, is a cousin. So, unfortunately, I didn't discover that until a few months after she died, or else I would have, it would have been a wonderful experience to contact her. Yes. But, mm. but my second book is about a relative of, on my mother's side, who with his family or most of his family emigrated to Canada. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Wow. That's a, that's quite an interesting uh, part of the of, of the family history and family tree. You know. Mm -hmm. Now you've done a great job. I mean, you talk about your grandfathers and the lineages and taking, you know, tracing that the progressions that have taken place and just helping us navigate, uh, you know, navigate the journey with your family. The book is quite fascinating. As I began to look at it and read it, I was like, my goodness, what efforts did it take for her to compile this book and be dedicated to this project? Is there anything that you would like to share with our audience in the time that we have left that you think is just something just exciting or uh, uh, that you would like to share? And we have we have about three minutes left. Take about a minute and a half. Anything that you want to share with our audience? Well, I'd like, I like. I wrote this down because I didn't want to waste the information. Being an only child and therefore last one in my particular line, I didn't. I wanted to write it down for posterity, and I thought that it would also help future genealogists because it gives them some idea as to what they could look for not necessarily religious beliefs but they can perhaps find death certificates and find that whether there was a medical history in the family things like that yes it's going to be a very helpful resource a very helpful mm -hmm. tool as people pursue and do that now i tell you me i can't imagine doing all of that i've tried i gave it a little flavor but i've tried do this for me share share with our viewing audience how they can uh contact you and uh, information from that perspective. How can they contact you and where can they go to get your book? Well, the book is on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, but if they go to my website, angelafortnum.com, they can order one direct from me. I have a limited number of books, but if they order them up to my website, I will sign a dedicated copy for them. Awesome. So if they want a signed copy of the book, you all heard that. If you want a signed copy of the book, go to the website to order your book. Give them that website once again. It's www.angelafortnum.com. That's F-O-R-T-N-U-M.com. Awesome. We thank you so much for being with us. You have been such a wonderful guest. We want to thank you all for joining us for this segment of Books of the Month. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Carnes. We look forward to seeing you again on our next broadcast for Books of the Month. Thank you so much, Ms. Angela. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. <laughs>